thank you very much. So let me in introduce myself. I'm Heather Lauha. I've been active in demos in from since, since the early 90s and have been coding demos and games for quite some time now. And today I'm going to talk about fixed point arithmetic for you. So let's see what uh, kind of topics I'm going to cover. First we will go through some points uh, why this mate might be relevant to talk about. And uh, then I will uh, give you a short introduction how fixed point numbers work and how the math goes. And of course I will go through some typical needed functions, stuff you need needing. And then I'll go through some problems and maybe show some tricks uh, how to go around problems. And then finally also give some tips for making a fixed point library. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I think it's probably best to ask them uh, uh, after the presentation if we have time for it. And note that all the slides will be available uh, from my homepage later and I'll show the, show the address at the end of the presentation so you don't need to try to write all stuff down. <laughs> okay, well, man uh, visited space and sent uh, probes to Jupiter and f wherever. Uh, this happened already tens of years ago, so you may imagine they didn't have quite fancy hardware present at that time. They used, uh, for example, for a Galileo mission, they used a processor RCA1802, which is uh, roughly equivalent to Commodore 64. <laughs> so imagine it's not a lot of power to have. Of course, it's a lot of work to do math on this kind of processors. For example, uh, for the Apollo software development effort, 30% the of the software was spent on scaling and keeping things in the right scale to be able to calculate the math properly. So later, all space applications switch to floating point c CPUs and stuff like that uh, to make it easier as well. Okay, so why I'm talking about this <laughs> if nobody seems to use it? Well, at least it's cool stuff. I at least if you make some retro demos and go take part in the old school competitions, then you have to use fixed point math. So, but is it otherwise relevant? You can claim, I can do zillion floating points calls in a second nowadays computers and there's no need to do fixed point stuff anymore. Or is there? Well, there's still many platforms where it's very relevant, actually. Almost all mobile devices have ARM, CPUs, no floating point units. For example, most phones and all the J2ME stuff tends to be like this, except that uh, only the later one uh, platforms support floating points as well. And also handheld golden consoles from Nintendo, for example, uh, don't have FUs or well, they ha you can use software floating point emulation on those machines, but it's very slow. And also, for example, you may have to do fixed point stuff on DSP programming, although they are is both fixed and floating point DSPs. <coughs> and for J2ME, this CLDC 1.0 doesn't support fixed uh, floating point at all, not even for slow calculation, so you have, have to do a journey fixed point. Also, OpenGL is a standard for embedded 3D. This is the new stuff on mobile and uh, embedded stuff hardware. Well, they do have profiles for both fixed point and floating point, but the most commonly available initially and as, as the time being is the common light profile which omits the floating point support. So it's, you not need to know fixed point math on for to de develop for the, those platforms. Also uh, on desktop, fixed point is often still a bit faster than floating point calculations, but often this is irrelevant because of the floating point advantages actually. Then there's this kind of haunting problem for some coders who try to sync implementation over network, dif maybe dif between different processors or ar architectures. 
that floating point calculations are prone to some differences between CPUs, compilers, or C libraries, or whatever. There's so many dependencies, and you're going to get so small changes there. And if you use fixed point, well, you are not going to suffer from those problems. And then finally, also one nice little point. If you are making four kilobyte intros, it's faster to use fixed point math uh, and also smaller. So you can typically shave off some, shave off some bytes by switching floating point calculation to fixed point. Okay, next we'll go to the introduction of fixed point arithmetic. First, we'll go through some basics. Then I show some notation and talk about a bit about range and precision. Show how to convert numbers and go through the basic, most basic operations. So, in layman's terms, uh, fixed point numbers are just integ integers scaled by some constant factor, and you store them as integers as well. Uh, for example, if you split a 32-bit signed in integer at half, then you're going to get this range here, which is, sounds pretty nice. Not that bad, even if, especially because it's going to be real numbers with this scale. Okay. Uh, and by the way, for most of the examples I'll be referring on this presentation, I'll be using this 16 and 16 bit split of integer just because it's the most commonly used format. So, first, let's take a brief look how integers work in base 2. Uh, here we are using just an 8 bit integer as an example, as it's easier to see in an image. Uh, each uh, column here represents just one bit slot in the 8-bit number. And uh, if you add together the numbers on the lower row, you're going to get 255, which is the maximum number for 8-bit integer. And this for signed 8-bit signed, uh, signed integer, we are going to get range from minus 128 to 127. Well, if we put a fixed point there, you can even see it. There. We split uh, so that our range will be a lot uh, smaller, but we are going to get some precision to numbers. So the fractional bits are going to represent the powers of 2 bit neg negative exponent, as you can see. Fixed point numbers have uh, two common notations. Uh, there's this m dot n, which means uh, M for m is number for the int integer part, and n is the number of bits for the fractional part. And also there's a q factor, which just only states the number of fractional parts bits. So we are going to use mostly the 16.16 .16 or q16, as for examples here. So range and precision. The closest number to zero for 16.16 16 is 1 per 65,536. And as you can see, it's pretty small number. So this sounds quite cool, actually. You get a lot of precision and range for 16.16. 16. And uh, for example, the previous 8-bit example, we can see that it's actually 4.4 .4 fixed point with range from minus 8 to 7, and this precision here. And by the way, if you have a 32-bit integer without fixed point uh, uh, fractional part, it's 32.0 fixed point number, just because there's no fractional part. Then uh, there's this conversion functions uh, from real and to fixed point numbers and uh, from fixed to real numbers and also from to integers. Note here that uh, we are rounding towards the nearest integer, but not in the integer version. We are not rounding towards the nearest integer. 
we could round, but not if we would, then uh, when we scale up or down to fixed point number, it uh, means that the resu result is going to change. But if we don't round, then it will stay the same and we don't get any precision loss there because of the conversion. Of course, you could use the same logic and wouldn't, uh, maybe you don't want to round for the real number conversion either, but that's up to you how do you choose to do that. And uh, to say it very short, uh, for real number conversion, you just multiply the number by the factor and round. And if you convert back to uh, real from fixed point, you cast first the number to float and divide by the factor. And for integers, it's just a simple shift up or down by the number of fractional bits. So let's look at the basic operations. Addition and sub su subtraction are very easy. They are just do it like normal integers. Multiplication is done by multiplying the two uh, fixed point numbers with each other. And uh, well, if you do some testing, you'll notice that, okay, this result is just in some ridiculously big number. But we can fix that by just shifting down by the amount of bits, which is fractional part, and we get the real number. Well, actually, no, it's not that simple. <coughs> it overflows very easily, as you can see. For example, if you, if you have numbers 2 and 2 as fixed point and multiply them, the intermediate result here is going to overflow to 32 bits, which we are using for, uh, for fixed point numbers. So what's going on? Actually, the intermediate result from the multiplication, multiplication is in Q32 format or 32.32, which means that we have to store the intermediate for uh, value in double-sized integer format. In this case, it have to be 64-bit int. And as you can see, <laughs> for C or Java code and stuff, uh, though typically it just you need a typecast and then you do a multiplication and you then you can shift down back and then cast back to normal 32-bit integer. So it's quite simple actually. Division goes with the same lines, uh, but in the other way. First, we have to construct the, the intermediate value in the Q32 and then divide with the 16.16 value and this way we are going to get the right result, as you can see. Uh, actually, the lower formula probably should have the typecast back to 32-bit int as well. If you want a little bit more in-depth uh, uh, introduction to fixed point uh, math with the basic operations and how the bits work, see, see more graphical examples and tables of the theory, then check out a few of the references for more text about that. Uh, sorry, I got back to here. Uh, <laughs> some more notes about the division as well. If you get your hands dirty on mobile devices again and make make your implementation of code with ARM assembler, you'll notice that the CPU lacks division instruction even for integers. This means that you have to iteratively implement the division yourself. Uh, in that case. Normally compiler do does that for you if you are not making it assembler code yourself. So I think Jim Blinn said it very well in a book called Dirty Pixels. He said, divisions wear out the electrons in our computer. And well, if you're going to have, have iterate for division, then <laughs> you can see why. So what the main point here is that division is much slower in, in the and multiplication, so you may want to cut back on those if you ever, ever just can. Okay. Next, let's look at some of the typically needed functions. It, there are of course you know, sine and cosine, arithmetic stuff, and arcus tangent for 
meter angles and square root. And there's this magic thing called cordic. Doesn't ring a bell probably for most of you. But we'll come to it. For the sine and cosine, a uh, typical approach is to use a lookup table. And uh, of course, it requires some memory uh, and more of it if you want some good precision for your values. But it's, of course, enough to actually store only a smaller portion of, portion of the sine curve as you can mirror and transform the rest of the values from those. Uh, there are a few, few part of the curve you are have stored. And you may also interpolate between the values. And uh, some people uh, even use nonlinear interpolation by sampling the lookup table twice to get some very slight uh, improvement even more. But of course, that's a little more work to do as well. But uh, it's also possible to construct fairly good approximations for sine of functions, which are also pretty simple, fast, and small. Some benefits for these are like you may be able to perform without having any kind of uh, lookup table to eat your memory, or you don't have to pre-calculate the lookup table, or, or you don't have to uh, store it in executable if you are limited on that side. There are different situations you may hit, and you need to have a different uh, approaches. And for example, check out this uh, DSP coders reference uh, in the references section. They are listed in the end. Uh, they have some quite nice implementations to approximate sign values and in get even even Q32 precision values, and even probably very small part of bit of code. Sorry. Also, the fixed point primer in book OpenGL ES game development shows code how to calculate some trigonometric functions using only a very small lookup table of Argus tangents, like 17 entries or something like that, if I remember correct. Okay, let's look at square root then. There's several pretty nice iterative algorithms, funky pieces of code. Uh, and I rec recommend you try to find some and try them out yourself. It can be as simple as trying to multiply inter integers, just normal numbers, uh, with each other, uh, I mean with itself, one by one, starting, starting with one, one to two, three, four, and so forth. Uh, until you find the closest uh, one uh, to the number you have, and then you know what's the square root. Uh, of course, that's not very efficient, but it's at least a very tiny amount of code. And you can, for example, from that, you can improve by making a binary search version of it. But I recommend that you just copy-paste Ken Turkowski's implementation. Uh, published in 1994 in some Apple technical report and later also in graphic graphics games file. And for your convenience, code on this si slide. Uh, maybe you can't read that, but well, I wasn't going to go over it up anyway. <laughs> so let's look at the arc arcus tangent. Uh, if you need only some very rough answer, Maybe like what octant you are lying in, the not exact angle or any anything. It's maybe even enough to check with some very simple logic uh, which octant you are in. It's just some few, few ifs or something like that. There should be a one like that in the references. I think it was also from one from one of the graphics games books. But for some more accurate results, try using Cordic, which will be covered shortly next. And uh, for my favorite approximation, uh, check, check out some DSP coding tricks again. <laughs> uh, they have some neat tricks and uh, those 
quite compact uh, code to get fairly nice results for Argos tangent as fixed point. The reference actually has has only pseudocode in floating point format, but but it's very easy to change to fixed point. So it, it's actually easier to read while it, it is in floating point because there's no of the scaling stuff done at that sample code. So what's the cordic? Uh, the cordic <laughs> comes from various coordinate rotation digital computer. And it's an algorithm which is implemented, uh, it's created in the 50s. And you can use ac it actually to calculate quite a wide set of different functions from like hyperbolic and trigonometric stuff. And this is the stuff they use in like some very simple calculators where you have a button to calculate sin value. Uh, that this is what they use there to do it because uh, it has been around so, so long. And it's quite an amazing algorithm. It, you, it has only a ver uh, some very small lookup tables and then it uses just some bit shifts and additions and stuff like that. And you just grind it like multiple iterations and suddenly you have a result which is actually quite accurate as well. <laughs> so you can use it for example to uh, just runtime, calculate values on the fly. It isn't that slow although it's the fastest approach. Or you can just use it to pre-calculate your lookup tables for example. Uh, this shows why the cortex is sometimes referred as Swiss army knife of for computing math functions. There's also some other approaches you can use to calculate trigonometric stuff. For example, you can try Taylor theories. If you want to do further research on that, uh, check for example Wikipedia or something. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff available from that math side. It's quite old concept as well. Okay. We are seem to be making nice progress here, so maybe we even have some time for the Q&A as well. Next, look, let's look at the KVATs and tricks. We have to make new uh, look to the range and precision, actually. Uh, these things were looking a bit too good at the first flights, I have to confess. We'll look more into that. And uh, then, of course, you have to watch out for division by zero. We'll look at that as well. There's a nice trick about modify algorithms to get exact results in the instead of some kind of uh, about their result. And and uh, I just give you a pointer where to find more information. And then s some words about dealing with problems. So let's look again at the range and precision. Uh, it's very typical that you need to raise things to power of two and store the result or take a square root. And let's see how well that actually works out with the precision we looked at before. To prevent final re result of 16.16 uh, bit fixed point number from overflowing, a value must be roughly less than 181. As you can see, if we multiply 181 uh, by itself, we get 32,761, which is almost the highest number available in our range. So suddenly things are not that good anymore because that's kind of really small number, isn't it? 181. Or if you want to prevent underflowing, value must be greater than 0 0.004 because if you multiply that by itself, you see what kind of number we are going to get. And that's so very close to the small, most smallest possible uh, positive number in fixed point. So you get truncated to the precision number. So it looks like it isn't that easy as actually after all at this moment. Yeah, it's so you have to be const constantly <laughs> careful with the scale of stuff 
make sure at every point that you keep things in the right scale so that you don't overflow or underflow. I'm not kidding. You make sure you put extra effort in keeping the things in the right scale. And similarly, make sure that the division isn't just O when you have divided something because if your, your divisor was too big. Or more hideous example is sometimes, sometimes I think it's more easily overlooked when this happens is if your divisor is too small and you divide a number with it. Because uh, if you have a divisor which is smaller than one, then of course your uh, result number is going to be bigger than the original number you're going to divide with. So I devised this funny formula here for calculating the approximate uh, value which should be the lower limit for your divisor. And as you can see here, for example, if you have uh, a value 30, 32 as fixed point number, so it's 32.0 uh, fixed point number or, or real number, and uh, then b must be this long number here, so that a a divided by b fits in 16.16 16 fixed point number. As you can see, it comes to quite close our upper range in that example here. If b would be one less, then actually our result was would over, or already overflow. Okay, well, what about division by zero? Uh, there's been uh, floating point numbers. I don't know how much you have dared how they work, but they have this thing uh, called infinite arithmetic. And it means that the uh, re result of division by zero and stuff like that, they are robustly defined with floating points so that you simply get infinite negative or positive uh, as a result, or you may get uh, not a number as a result. But it uh, makes coding easier. You can just check, okay, well, it goes like this, and but actually it sometimes also goes unnoticed by mistake. So that just keep happily going forward with your software and think it works well, and then after one hour it has been running, you start noticing hey, there's something weird going on that it's hard, harder to trace back at that point. But still, the infinite arithmetic is quite a nice thing to have because with fixed point or inter integers, you have to manually take care of the division by zero because it leads to hard interrupt or something like that, or an exception which means that normal programs just crash when you divide by zero. I'm pretty sure you have seen that happening. Uh, I think it might be possible to in install some inter interrupt handler to take care of that and stuff like that. I think in, in a game called Descent, you have probably played it like 10 years ago or something. They actually made their texture filler uh, uh, faster by allowing division by zero on purpose, and I mean with fixed mod numbers, so that when it actually goes doing something wrong and divide by zero, they just catch the exception of the divided by zero and say, ah, just okay, and let's go forward then. <laughs> and well, it actually was really fast for the game for its time. So maybe you can do some nice tricks like this, but. Uh, it's kind of magic as well. I haven't done that kind of extreme stuff. I think it's better to make sure that you don't divide by zero. So what was the exact result stuff I meant? Uh, in some case, cases, if you have some formula, let's say from ray tracing or checking if your thing is one on one side or other or something like that, and it often involves a division at the end of the algorithm, and then you can figure out from the one number you get at the result what is the thing you want. And uh, actually, in some cases, when you have algorithm like that, it's possible to actually just leave out the division so that you have the numerator and denumerator and exa examine the actual result from those. And uh, check out the reference here from the realtimecollisiondetection.net. 
Uh, it's a GDC 05 and 06 presentation, which has uh, one uh, more concrete example of this, what I'm speaking. But actually, generally speaking, it's rare and to be able to take advantage of something like this and hard. But I wanted to mention it because it might be a really good thing to use if you just notice that you can do it. Then uh, when you are dealing with some problems which are you are bound to get because especially if you are used to floating points, you'll be troubled by math inaccuracies a lot more than you have used to do. And even if, even if there's some cases where fixed points are better than floats, it's kind of pain sometimes. So one thing is that you may try to do more work with the wider intermediate results. Just uh, maybe you can do some of the stuff in the wide 64-bit format and then later just convert back and that may solve your problems. And just remember to be pedantic. Use asserts and make verification checks a lot. Uh, and compare calculations to float version and see if it's even about there what you want to do. Okay, and then let's go to the some tips for making a fixed point library. Ada has built in support, so just coding it. O okay, I imagine you don't work in it. <laughs> Uh, for C and C++, uh, just, uh, you could just inline the code, just there write scalings and multiplications, all that. It kind of leads to messy code also. But you can use uh, macros to do conversions and uh, the operations. Or more fancy, for C++, you can make a real number class, overload the operators, multiplication, addition, division, all that and put our code in a header so that the code gets inlined. So there's no performance penalty, but the code is much easier to cope with when you do it like this. And you can put asserts to overflow and underflow situations, so catch them immediately with debug builds. And you, it, this kind of approach also allows you to transparently switch between fixed and floating point. For example, myself, I have been now using, uh, I have a real number class, which I have just floating point version of it and fixed point number, ver number per version of it. And I can just switch very easily between those and see how they differ in builds. And <coughs> if you go in further, you can get a, create a debug version of the real, real number class and actually perform the fixed point and floating point calculations in parallel. So when you multiply you inside the class, you'll multiply a floating point version and fixed point version. So you keep both, ver both values in your class. And this is really cool because it also, in addition of detecting uh, overflow, underflow, and stuff like that, I you can also detect drifting because if you have a long algorithm with uh, metric stuff and uh, normalization and divisions and multiplication and stuff like that. And maybe you just have some mistakes there but that you could scale it better other way. And you can more easily detect that the re result is drifting away from the wanted result if you use a <coughs> class like this. And you can also make some stuff there that you can, for example, for the asterisks and other checks, you can uh, configure it, uh, the class so that you can uh, toggle all the pedantic checks on for some wanted piece of code and then toggle it off so that only the very core parts get verified more exactly if you think you want to do some tricks like this. And then also if you work on J2ME, it's best to just inline all the calculations one way or other because if you use some class uh, to do all the stuff, it's very slow compared to inlining yourself because uh, the method calls are very slow. And then so also one uh, note about the multiplications and uh, stuff and scales. Remember that uh, even that I recommend that you make the, uh, the or, or I say that you have to put the intermediate result in 64-bit or double size integer. 
sometimes you know that your range and precision for the numbers is actually a, a smaller than the maximum range. And on those cases, it's uh, good to check if you can scale, scale the Q factors down just enough so that your intermediate result actually fits in 32 bits. Because if you do that, it's actually going to be even, even slightly more faster. And it may be better, if ex ex uh, especially on J2ME platforms and uh, very slow platforms like that. Okay, and then also some other tidbits. Uh, nice uh, side mention about the Pogo sticker, my game from last year, Assembly Game Devel Development Competition. For the last version of it, I actually switched the physics from floating point to fixed point that nobody noticed anything. So it also kind of proves that uh, you can make, make them quite, quite equal and equ equivalent usually with some, some effort. Then there's a nice trick that you can do fixed point uh, absolute value uh, fetching uh, without branching so you don't have to have if for it. Here you can see the code for it. It's quite simple actually, but <laughs> actually that one is patented. But that's not the only way. Check the references listed there, and uh, uh, there's some slight variations of it, which are, are not the patented ones. And not also that not all countries actually the patents are valid. I think it's probably in the US, but not here. Okay. Then this uh, funky to note that uh, for 32-bit integer, or any integer with a signed integer with the highest bit on, is kind of special, the one value there, of the wall integer, the one value which is special. Because if you have the code like this, check if it's l less than zero, and if it is, then take the opposite side value, so when you get, so it's kind of simple absolute value fetch. But if your value is the uh, integer, uh, signed integer with highest bit on, and you put the result in signed bit in the integer as well, well, suddenly your result is actually negative as well. And what's happening here is that the result is overflowing because the result uh, doesn't fit in the uh, positive side of the signed integer space you are using. So it overflows to the negative side and you get the same number again. And this is nice to know this. It's probably one in the billion, billion times you're ever going to be bugged about things like this, but it's kind of intriguing to think about issues like this when you look at your code and notice that, well, okay, once in a million years, this is going to crash very bad. <laughs> so in this example here, it's the right solution is to cast the result to unsigned int, and then it works properly does what you exact ex expect it to do. Uh, there's the references. Uh, quite small font, yeah. Some uh, final words as well. Uh, uh, when looking for fixed point algorithm and solutions, look beyond just demo and game code. There are some years or even tens of years old research papers and publications you might want to check out as for example the Cordic algorithm it's very old but it's still relevant to use and also DSP programmers some often have nice tricks and then uh, of course have to pitch that uh, well check out the game development compass entries these are on a game uh, there's a J2ME game called Starific. Uh, it uses fixed point math. It's for. Uh, it works on both uh, J2ME phone and desktop and applets, and it comes with sources. So you may want to check it out. It's made by a friend of mine. And don't my forget to uh, try my game as well. It's called Racing Pitch. Well, I'm pitching Racing Pitch, <laughs> and well, you just need a microphone to play it, and you must imitate engine sounds to drive a racing car in it. <laughs> Try it. Or go check it in the game development competition. It's going to be after this seminar. 
Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And now I think we have now some time for time for questions and answers as well.